Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Fullerton, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about Newton's second law. Newton's second law of motion may be the most important uh, law we have in all of our understanding of traditional physics, of classical physics. Even more so, it is useful in so many different areas that it's certainly one of the areas we want to focus. And this is going to be a very short, brief overview of Newton's second law, but there are so many more things you can do with it. So we'll follow up with some other videos showing some demonstrations, some applications, and some other uh, subtleties to applying it in various situations. So our goal for today, we want to explain the relationship between acceleration, force, and the mass of an object, which is really the root of Newton's second law. Then we want to apply Newton's second law to a number of different problems. We'll try and understand the difference between mass and weight. And finally, we'll talk about static equilibrium and what Brent is. So, diving right in. Newton's second law of motion. It says that the acceleration of an object is in the direction of and directly proportional to the net force applied. And it's inversely proportional to the object's mass. If you wanted to write that mathematically, what you would say is the net force vector is equal to mass times acceleration. So if you apply a force to an object, the object is going to accelerate in the direction of that force. The bigger force you apply, the more acceleration. Now the bigger the object's mass, the less acceleration. And you see this all the time. Imagine trying to push a tractor trailer in a specific direction. It has a huge mass, so no matter how hard you push, you're not going to get much acceleration. Now try doing the same thing to a little matchbox car of the semi-truck. Apply the same force and that little matchbox truck is going to have a huge acceleration. And that's in the direction that you are applying the force. So net force is also one of the key points. Net force means it's the overall force after you've looked at all the vectors. For example, if you're fighting with your sister or brother over a piece of Halloween candy, one of you pulls a piece of candy with the force of five newtons this way. The other pulls with the force of five newtons that way. The net force is zero. There will be no acceleration on the candy. It's going to remain just as it is. However, if one of you pulls with six newtons and the other pulls with five newtons, the person pulling with six newtons is going to cause an acceleration in their direction. Now also note, because we also have Newton's first law, an object at rest will remain at rest, and an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by a net force. Just because something has a force on it does not mean it's accelerating. A satellite flying through space, let's put it way out in space, not even in orbit, flying through space. If you apply a 5 Newton force to it in one direction and someone else applies a 5 Newton force to it in another direction, it's going to just continue on as it was, continue its motion with no acceleration. You need to have a net force to change acceleration. All right. So, if you look at this, Newton's first law is really just a subset of Newton's second law. It's what happens when you have a net force of zero. If the net force is zero, the object will continue in its current state of motion, a constant velocity in a straight line. If you have an unbalanced force, if you do have a net force that's not equal to zero, then you get the acceleration in the direction. So. Newton's second law is more encompassing, a more general version. Newton's first law is just a specific case of Newton's second law. So if you understand Newton's second law, you really don't have to remember Newton's first law. To apply Newton's second law, we'll follow a set of generalized steps. One of the first things you want to do is draw a free body diagram, and we've talked about how you make those. For any forces that don't line up with the x or y axes, break those forces up into components that do lie on the x or y axis. This is what we were doing when we talked about pseudo free body diagrams. Then you're going to write expressions for the net force in each of the directions of the axis, in the x direction and the y direction. If you're going in three dimensions, in the z direction too. Then set that net force equal to ma, since Newton's second law tells you that the net force on an object is equal to the mass times its acceleration. Finally, solve the resulting equations. Let's take a look at some simple examples. We have a force of 25 newtons east and a force of 25 newtons west acting concurrently, that means in the same place and at the same time, on a five kilogram cart. Find the acceleration of the cart. 
Well, first we'll draw a free body diagram. There's our cart. We have a force of 25 newtons to the east and 25 newtons to the west. And let's call this the x direction, our x axis. Therefore, the net force in the x direction is going to be 25 newtons in the positive direction minus 25 newtons, since that's in the negative direction, is equal to zero. And that must also be equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. Of course, mass is five kilograms, therefore we can state that the acceleration in the x direction must be zero. There is no net force. They balance out. Let's take a look at another one. A point one five kilogram baseball moving at 20 meters per second is stopped by a player in point oh one seconds. What is the average force stopping the ball? A little bit more complex here. So let's take a look. We're given the information that mass is equal to 0.15 kilograms. The initial velocity of the ball is 20 meters per second. The final velocity of the ball is 0 meters per second. And the time for all of this is 0.01 seconds. We want to find the force. Well, when I look at that, right away I'm thinking, well, Newton's second law, I have mass, but I don't have acceleration. So let's see if we can't figure out acceleration first. We can do that using our kinematic equations. Acceleration equals change in velocity over time, or final velocity minus initial velocity over time. That's going to be 0 minus 20 meters per second over 0 0.01 seconds for a total acceleration of negative 2,000 meters per second squared. All right, once we have that, now we can figure out the net force. Net force on the ball must be mass times acceleration, or 0.15 kilograms, times our acceleration of negative 2,000 meters per second squared, which is equal to about negative 300 newtons. And the negative signs in the acceleration and the force are really only saying that it's in the opposite direction of what we defined as positive initially. So the acceleration and the force are opposite the direction the baseball was initially moving. That makes sense because we're bringing it to rest. So our answer, 300 newtons. Let's try another one. Two forces, F1 and F2, are applied to a block on a frictionless horizontal surface as shown below. If the magnitude of the block's acceleration is 2 meters per second squared, find the mass of the block. Well, let's start with our free body diagram. We have 2 newtons to the right, and we have 12 newtons to the left. Now I'm going to pull out a little trick. And realizing that we have the larger force to the left, why don't we call to the left the positive x direction? We can call any direction we want to be positive. So let's try it this time and see what happens. Now when we write our net force equation, the net force in the x direction is going to be equal to positive 12 newtons, because that's in the same direction as our positive x, minus 2 newtons, because 2 newtons is opposite what we called positive, or 10 newtons. Now if we want to know the mass of the block, well, net force is also equal to mass times acceleration. Therefore, mass must be net force over acceleration, which must be equal to 10 newtons over squared our acceleration, or 5 kilograms. F net equals ma, another way to use it. Let's take a look at just one more here. A 25 newton horizontal force northward and a 35 newton horizontal force southward act concurrently same place, same time, on a 15 kilogram object on a frictionless surface. Find the object's acceleration. Well, we'll start with our free body diagram again. We've got a 25 newton force north. We have a 35 newton force south. And let's call down our positive y direction in this case. Now, when we take a look at this, our net force in the y direction is going to be positive 35 newtons minus 25 newtons for a net force of 10 newtons. Now to find acceleration, that must be F net over M, or 10 newtons 
over 15 kilograms, which is 0 0.67 meters per second squared. Now, of course, the direction of that acceleration must be in the direction we called positive or south, the direction of the larger force. It says magnitude. We don't have to write south there, but we understand what it is. All right. While we're talking about these things, let's take a second to talk about the difference between mass and weight. Mass is the amount of stuff something is made up of. It's an object's inertia, its resistance to being accelerated. The mass of an object doesn't change. Well, not unless if you wanted to change my mass, you could cut an arm off or something. But for the most part, mass is constant. Weight, however, is the force of gravity on an object. The weight of an object can change depending on how large a gravitational field you put that object in. I have a mass of roughly 100 kilograms here, and on the moon I have a mass of roughly 100 kilograms. My weight varies quite considerably, though. Here on Earth, my weight would be roughly 1,000 newtons, while on the moon it would be roughly one-sixth of that. So your weight changes depending on the gravitational field you're in. Your mass is a constant. So let's take a look at a sample problem. An astronaut weighs 1,000 newtons on Earth. What is the weight of the astronaut on planet X, where the gravitational field strength, G, is 6 meters per second squared? Well, here on Earth, my weight, which we write as mg, the astronaut's weight, is about 1,000 newtons. Therefore, the mass of that astronaut must be 1,000 newtons over 9.8 meters per second squared, which is about 102 kilograms. On planet X, however, and let's just write this as weight on planet X to make sure that we're clear, must be mass times the acceleration due to gravity or gravitational field strength on planet X, which is going to be 102 kilograms times 6 meters per second squared comes out to be about 612 newtons. So weight varies, mass not so much. Then we're fortunate enough to meet this friendly green alien over here. And on planet X, that alien weighs 400 newtons. What's the mass of that alien? Well, remember, weight on planet X is mass times the acceleration due to gravity, or gravitational field strength on planet X. Therefore, the mass of the alien must be its weight on X divided by the gravitational field strength of X, or 400 newtons over 6 meters per second squared for a total mass of about 66.7 kilograms. This is why when we talk about weight, we prefer to write it as mg on the free body diagrams. Already you know the formula for weight. Static equilibrium. This is what happens when you have no net force on an object. All the forces on an object are balanced. A coffee mug sitting on a table is in static equilibrium. We have the force of gravity pulling it down. We have the normal force from the table pushing it up. They're exactly balanced, therefore the object doesn't accelerate. The equilibrant is a single force vector that you add to some amount of unbalanced forces in order to bring an object into static equilibrium. Makes a little more sense when you look at an example. In this problem, we have a 20 newton force due north and a 20 newton force due east acting concurrently on an object. What additional force is required to bring the object into equilibrium? Or we could call this the equilibrant vector. Well, to figure this out, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what my net force is already. If I've got 20 newtons east and 20 newtons north, if you remember, I can add up vectors by lining them up tip to tail. So I'm going to move this 20 newton north over here and draw a line from the starting point of my first to the ending point of my last. That resultant, then, is going to be my total net force vector. And the magnitude of my resultant, let's write that this way, magnitude of my resultant, using the Pythagorean theorem, must be the square root of 20 newtons squared plus 20 newtons squared, which comes out to be about 28 newtons. So my net force is 28 newtons to the northeast. I want, that's my unbalanced force. If I want to balance it, I need a force that's going to exactly oppose or cancel that out. Therefore, if my resultant is 28 newtons to the northeast, my equilibrant 
must be 28 newtons to the southwest. So my equilibrant is going to be the vector that looks something like this. 28 newtons back to the southwest to balance that all out. That's all an equilibrant is. It's the vector you add to an unbalanced force in order to bring it into static equilibrium. A 3 newton force and a 4 newton force are acting concurrently on a point. Which force could not produce equilibrium with these two forces? So we've got a 3 newton force and a 4 newton force. We can line them up any way we want, but what force could not be an equilibrant for those? Well, 3 plus 4 is 7 newtons, so anything greater than 7 newtons won't be an equilibrant. 9 newtons can't put those into equilibrium. Have a great day.